Welcome to Go Figure. My name is Nadeem Makarin, CEO and founder of Gojek, Southeast Asia's first super app. Gojek does ride hailing, food delivery, payments, even on demand massages. You name it, we do it. Go Figure is a podcast dedicated to expose the inner workings of ambitious tech companies in the emerging world. We like to talk about things we like and talk about things we don't like. There are a lot of myths out there that we want to dispel, so keeping it real is kind of our mantra. Hope you enjoy it. Welcome to our Go Figure podcast. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having us. Yep, glad to be here. Yeah. Um, I'll just do a quick round of introductions to you guys. Um, so we have here Hans Patuo, our COO of all of Gojek. Uh, Hans currently leads uh, a team of roughly 2,000 people. Yes. Is that correct? 2,000 people and counting uh, across all our driver operations, customer service operations, across how many cities, Hans? 88. 88 cities, oh my goodness, okay. Um, and uh, Hans uh, is actually also from McKinsey, just like me before. Yeah. Previously, you were a partner, um, and now you're joining the tech world. So welcome to the show, Hans. Thanks, man. And I'd also like to introduce Dito. Uh, his Hello. name is Raditya Wibo, but we call him Dito. Mm -hmm. uh, Dito is a whiz kid. He is also ex-McKinsey. Right? He went to university in Indonesia, locally, mm -hmm. ITB, which yeah. is the kind of like the IIT of Indonesia, sure. um, and uh, Dito uh, is only 27 years old and now leads the entire product group uh, for transport, which is our go ride and car, our motorcycle transportation, ride hailing, and our car ride hailing, mm -hmm. um, who's just recently launched Singapore. Congratulations. Thank Dito. you. Yeah. Um, so Dito manages about roughly around 3 million transactions per day mm -hmm. at the moment, and uh, Hans over here. Uh, basically manages around 1 million uh, active drivers uh, across Indonesia uh, uh, and also now Vietnam and Singapore. And so Hans handles operations, Dito handles product, and the topic of today is a very, very hot topic, a very m messy, messy hot topic about how technology and product engineering can collaborate effectively with operations. Mm. How do we mix and interact between the digital arm of the company that is user facing and the operational arm, which is very mm. human intensive, labor intensive, uh, messy, and spans across such a wide geographic uh, uh, area, right? So I'd like to kind of kick off the discussion with kind of some of your principles uh, of what you've learned. Uh, uh, across your journey working together and what you found to be some of the mistakes that you've made and some of the insights that you've had. Mm -hmm. So I'll kick it off to you guys. Dito, you want to start? Sure. So um, yeah, I guess you know the, the, the main thing you need to remember when working with ops is to basically talk to each other, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's really Podcast easy. done. Podcast done. Just talk. <laughs> but it's really easy to forget that It is. Right? You know, especially when, you know, you're working with a developer team and you're not always there on the ground, right? And you have an ops team that's basically there listening to the driver's complain, looking at weird things happening on the driver's phone. And, you know, it's almost easy to forget that, you know, whatever you're coding and whatever you're deploying actually gets used by real people at scale sometimes, right? And I think with Indonesia in particular, the drivers are particularly interesting because um, at least when we started out for a lot of them, it was kind of their first exposure to mm. a smartphone, mm. right? Or to doing something on an app. So a lot, of, um, a lot of the things we had to do to make the app usable for them had to be learned through, you know, a lot of, like we basically had to keep talking to them a lot, right? I mean, an example of where I failed here is one of the things I, I tried to do was redesign the driver app for um, package deliveries. If you remember our Google yeah, Save Day days. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I tried to be smart and I was like, ah, oh, the current design isn't that great. Like, this is how it should be. So I tried to design it myself. Like, uh, there was a little map that showed on the bid screen, right? Well, that showed the pickup and the drop off. And when that actually went to drivers, they didn't understand it at all, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, the, the, the team actually and had And that was to, because you did not first talk to the operations team. Correct. That, that was that was when we failed to do that, right? We assumed that, you know, drivers would just get it if it's intuitive, but that's not how it mm. works, right? Right. Know, changing habits is very, very hard. Mm. Okay. Right. 
And mm-hmm. when you when you talk about like you know just communicate, what what do you think is the primary root cause that you know engineers and product managers don't talk to operations? Like what mm. what what's what's actually happening there? Why is there not? Why did we not collaborate much quicker in our first time of our evolution? And what did you guys do to kind of fix that? Mm. Yeah, so I'm happy to take a step at that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I remember when I first came in, I think what I felt was there was quite a big divide between uh, ops, which was very much in the trenches day to day, uh, highly anecdotal, uh, not perhaps the most analytical um, and savvy with data, and what I will call, quote unquote, for lack of a better term, the online world, right, which is product and devs, which were very, very proficient with data, very, very savvy, but lacks a little bit of the understanding of what's happening on the ground. Right. So the reality is that there was a, a gulf, there was a divide, and there were not enough, let's say, people or processes to help bridge the two. Yeah. So uh, the, uh, what will happen is that we will be talking different languages. Yeah, and I think something unique here mm-hmm. for Gojek is we were literally talking different languages, right? Because yeah, that's the true. Were, <laughs> that, that, that's also true there too. were Indians and yes. Singaporeans and yes. Indonesians. Correct, yeah. correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I, if I were to, to look back and I were to think about it, um, we will get into these situations where uh, let's say the ops, the field team will come back with insightful observations, but highly anecdotal and not maybe the best backed up by data. On the other hand, um, the product team or the tech team will come in with a, a ton of data, strong information, but perhaps uh, translating information into the appropriate insight was a little bit of a finding a needle in a haystack. Because yeah. they didn't know how things operated on the ground. Correct. Right? Correct. They were just seeing bits. Yeah. Or, or they, they saw the data, but sometimes the data doesn't tell uh, the complete picture. Mm. So for example, when, um, if let's say we look at the impact of rain, right? In certain cities in Indonesia, whenever there's rain, the, the completion rate of our two-wheel, of our motorcycle uh, tra- transportation service uh, drops quite significantly. So that's a piece of information. But there can be multiple insights to this. One insight would be, oh, you know, drivers don't want to get wet. Uh, so the solution is, let's give them more money. But in the reality, there's also another Meaning so insight. so that they'd be more willing to take that order Correct. despite getting wet. Exactly. Right. Uh, but then in reality, there could be another explanation, which is in certain cities in Indonesia, the infrastructure is not very good. And so the roads are just flooded. Even right. if you wanted to, you could not go out. Right. Right. So same piece of information, different insights, which was the right one. Right. So it's melding these two anecdotal insights and data-driven information that um, always seem to be the gap somewhere. So that data-driven solution, which seemed correct on paper, would have led us to spend unnecessarily a lot more without any further uh, drivers actually willing to get out there. Or right? it would that- have yes, or it would have helped us in only selected cities and right. not in others. Right. right. And that's because of some local know-how Correct. that was there. Correct. Let's talk a little bit more about the, the different languages. And I'm not only talking about literal languages, mm-hmm. but also the different kind of paradigms and nuances of how ops uh, people tend to behave and how do product engineering people tend to behave. Because, mm-hmm. the, because of their work is so different, I'm sure there are some behavioral uh, differences between them. So yeah. what have you noticed about that? Maybe that's interesting. Yeah, yeah I think Hunter is a really good point around you know um, anecdote-based information versus mm-hmm. you know being purely data-driven, right? Because there is always some middle ground that you need to find, right? Yeah. It's kind of like the anecdotes are super useful, but you know taken in isolation, they're not. You Correct. can't use them to debug things, right? right. right? But right. on the other hand, the data is not useful unless you actually go there and see what it's causing on the ground, right? Yeah. For example. Um, there was this one time where we were debugging this issue where drivers were complaining about getting multiple bids at once, right? And I think the engineering team spent a lot of time, you know, looking at it, and it was kind of hard to figure out what was going on, right? Then um, they came to Jakarta. I took them to this uh, pangkalan uh, near my apartment, right? So basically, uh, you took the engineers down. To I took showed it. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah okay. I took our our, our our tech our tech lead, yeah. right? Uh, then um, he had a driver phone and he turned it on and he could see that the orders were like coming in one after the other, they were stacking and we go down and meet the drivers and they say the same thing, like they're all showing us their phones and it's all happening on their phones and, and that I guess is what kind of made him realize that it's a, it's a big problem, right? So then the next day Shobit and Niranjan paired and fixed it. 
So, you know, actually just yeah. getting them to come and see what's happening on the ground is very, very powerful. So, so like interaction yeah. and, and face-to-face -face interaction is not just important for alignment, basically, right? But mm. I think the key takeaway there is that actually things get done when there is a clear buy-in. Correct. Mm. Across both product engineering and yeah. ops, right? And so, so the problem is when product engineering doesn't see things on the ground, the level of buy-in is also extremely low on the things that ops thinks are like super critical items. Yeah, because right. to be fair, sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes there are issues that keep popping up that are kind of hard to fix mm. uh, from, from the tech side. For example, one of our top complaints at some point was no orders. <laughs> right, and you know that that could have been a tech issue. It could also just have been oversupply. Correct. Right, but Correct. it's hard you to mean figure drivers out. Drivers just not getting any orders suddenly. It basically, yeah. drivers uh, calling into our call center and complaining, "Hey, I'm not getting any orders. What's yeah. wrong?" Like yeah. uh, some of the cases were like legitimate cases, right? Like yeah. their their pings got stuck or something. But you know, a lot of the other like most of the tickets, I think, from the analysis were actually um, yeah. repeat yeah. offenders, right? Correct. Yeah, they they weren't actually facing a technical issue. They yeah. just weren't getting enough orders, right? So either they were standing by in locations where there weren't enough orders or something else. But, you know, sometimes it's hard to separate, uh, you know, what's actually a technical issue versus what is actually a behavioral issue, right? right. So that's kind of the balance we yeah. always have to strike. I think uh, yeah. if I may add one more thing, um, one thing that we've been working very hard on also on the ops side is to be able to speak with data convincingly. Right, because we we also have the the responsibility to provide relevant insights and information in an actionable way, so that product and tech uh, can work on it. Right. right, it doesn't help if we keep coming up with uh, anecdotal uh, comments only. And on the flip side, uh, to your point, right, once there is this, uh, once we talk to each other, mm -hmm. and if we, we we realize, for example, that this this problem actually will may take some time to fix from a product perspective. Then I think the onus is on the ops team to figure out, okay, uh, how, which other ways can we skin this cat, right? Because there are the other levers or hacks or whatever way that we want to, to, to think about it to kind of temporarily improve the situation, right? So it's kind of more like collaborate with compassion, right? As opposed to, hey, I see this, you're not listening to me and, and vice versa. Yeah. I think we, we, you know, in the beginning, I think we need to be honest that you know, a lot of people in operations, both driver operations and customer service operations, felt that they were kind of orphaned from mm -hmm. a priority perspective mm -hmm. for product engineering needs, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. they also had, they mm -hmm. had, you know, product engineering True. needs. They needed yep. automation. Yes. They were doing things super inefficiently in the beginning, yep. et cetera. But they're st they seem to struggle to get the attention of the product group and to get their needs prioritized. Mm -hmm. Now, I do not think this is a Gojek only problem. Mm -hmm. I think that in almost all tech companies, when there is a major operational mm -hmm. component, you've got this kind of uh, a bias towards uh, uh, working on things that are kind of shiny and affecting consumers mm -hmm. and really, uh, because it's consumer driven and it's the consumer, but <coughs> in reality, there are mission critical components of, of operations that will in the end affect consumer experience. So for example, if the team cannot onboard drivers using a self-service platform, mm. then we simply cannot manage demand and supply right. in the most efficient way and therefore customers will get no driver, Correct. right? In Correct. various situations. So, yeah. so how, how do we reconcile that? What's, what's been going on there and, and what, where have you felt the trend moving towards? Okay. So, I'm glad that you brought this up and um, you know really I give a lot of credit to Vichy and Param. So Vichy is the group product manager of OpStack and Param is the tech lead. I recall um, about 11 months ago uh, the OpStack team indeed was in certain cases uh, much of an orphan. Uh, we had very few uh, uh, Gojek developers working on it and I would say that over the past 12 months uh, or 11 months it has really really uh, improved significantly. Uh, let me give you some, rather than going through the whole journey, let me give you some examples of what has been created. Uh, when you talk about ops, you know, we have 88 locations outside of Jabodetabek, right? And we have hundreds, multiple hundreds. For those listeners that don't know, Jabodetabek is a way of describing Greater yes. Jakarta. That's right. Which Thank is you. the capital of Indonesia. Yeah. Got it. And you know, we have uh, hundreds of um, Gojek employees or Gojek agents, what we call Go Troops, right? Are scattered throughout the archipelago. And if you were to walk into one of these locations, it would seem like we were a non-tech company, mm. right? Lots of paper, <laughs> desktops, and that's you, an understatement. Yeah, it's like you will walking around and say, "Hmm, yeah. super long lines, super long lines," <laughs> and you just there and scratch your head. 
um, in the past quarter, what has happened? We have rolled out two products uh, that significantly, I will say like the, probably the first ever products that helps with on the ground field operations. Or are they? So one of them is a collaboration with the driver platform team where drivers who want to get service in our, one of our walk-in offices can actually book an appointment slot ahead of time. So they don't have to all come in early in the morning and wait for four hours. Like a doctor appointment exactly. app, right? Exactly. Basically, they yeah, can yeah. choose and they can select the day, they can select the time. That helps us tremendously on, on our end as well, right? providing good service to the drivers and reducing the amount of time that we take them out from, the, from being a driver. Uh, first time ever. The second thing that we have recently launched is what we call an agent app. So first time ever, right? So now uh, our, our field agents actually have an app that will help them to allow them to onboard and acquire uh, drivers. And this is but the beginning of adding more and more functionality to this app. So I'd say that we have taken, uh, perhaps a little bit delayed, but we have certainly have taken a, a massive stride forward to using tech to enable our frontline operations as well. Mm. That's fascinating. Yeah. But then when you get to the debate, and let's say we have a finite amount of resource, yeah. and there's two different priorities, and yeah. one is, has to do with like, oh my God, you know, like uh, we, we have this major issue uh, whereby uh, we can't, for example, edit destination. Yeah. And, and then compare <laughs> that to a major operational, how do you even win that battle? How yeah. can ops even win yeah. that battle? I right? think because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, at least for us, the most valuable resource, for lack of a better word, is developer bandwidth, right? right. And, uh, you know, the thing is, operating in a country like Indonesia, um, where, honestly, like, labor is relatively cheap, means that, you know, sometimes it's actually more efficient to throw people at a problem as yes. opposed to actually building a smart Sometimes. solution for it. And I think a lot and of a lot of our listeners out there don't don't understand that that actually in, in various different economies, like it's actually cheaper to uh, deploy human resource Correct. as opposed to uh, actually deploying tech resource. Yeah. In the short run. Yes. In the and, short run. And the short run is very tempting for product managers mm. to just go with that option, right? It's kind of like, okay, right. I can have my developers build this cool new feature that'll solve a lot, a lot of problems or make life easier for the operations team. But, you know, I think they've got it handled for now, right? But the thing is, that doesn't last long, right? Like after a certain point, <laughs> no. all those manual, like, you know, the Google yes. Sheets yes. and the way we keep track of issues, it just explodes, right? So at the end of the day- I like think we, we upgraded from Excel Sheets <laughs> to Google Sheets, and now we finally have an app, right? That was kind of the, the yeah, evolution of it. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Not even an app, a portal, yeah. a web portal. Yeah, because you know, the, ma the manual process is no matter how good the people working on them are, you hit a natural limit once you reach a certain scale, yes. right? Because it's just not, manageable yes. to maintain massive, a massive spreadsheet with all the issues and yeah. all, right? So, you know, um, the thing is like, once you let it get to that, to that scale, then it's much harder to fix, right? Yeah. So, kind of my take on that is, um, I think the, the discussion is gonna shift more to going far versus going fast. Yeah. So when you're trying to go fast, just close your eyes and throw people at a problem, right? But at some point in time, you go fast, but you won't end up going very far. Right. So, as, as we think about how, um, how Gojek is scaling up, both in Indonesia as well as outside of Indonesia, and we think of you know, all the things uh, of our in increasing scale and all the things that we're trying to do in, on the platform, um, once we skew the conversation towards going far, which requires things to be interconnected, to be scalable, to be friction-free, then I think that that to me is the real driver of, of the debate. So it's not so much is it ops or is it product, it's more far or fast, right? Yeah, I think. Agreed. Yeah. And I guess my point is, you know, below a certain scale, it's absolutely fine sometimes. Correct. Actually, right? If you have ops processes that work and you're not getting overloaded, Correct. and you'd rather use the dev bandwidth for other things, that's fine, right? The thing is, once you hit that certain, once you hit that limit, Correct. then it blows up, right? Correct. So, I think a lot of people yeah. would be shocked to hear you say that, Dito, that you shouldn't automate everything, especially people from the tech hmm. world. But what's your argument against uh, uh, you know, automating everything? Like what, what things should never actually be automated, mm. for example? So an example would be experiments, right? Things mm. like, you know, uh, like in Singapore, we're doing a lot of this right now. Um, when we test new driver incentive schemes, we could spend you know, one or two weeks actually coding them and automating everything, or we could kind of run an experiment, have someone manually calculate you know, the driver 
uh, progress towards the target and kind of send them that through an SMS and kind of see how they respond, right? So, and then if you see you're getting good traction and it's actually working as intended, then you can automate it, right? So right. I think, you know, one situation where um, you might not want to automate it immediately is when you're just testing things out, yeah. right? Second is, again, like when you are not kind of reaching the, a level of scale where you're hitting that limit where it just blows up if you don't automate it. Right, and I, th I think like um, a lot of other, I mean, when I talk to friends who work at other startups in Indonesia, um, you know, sometimes this is where they are, right? It's kind of like, they're still trying to figure out product market fit, so they try a lot of different things, and because developer bandwidth is so scarce, sometimes it's um, easier to experiment using manual ops processes, right? And, you know, uh, as long as it doesn't, as long, before you reach the scale where it blows up, at least my opinion is it's actually okay, mm -hmm. right? right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I want to kind of dive a little bit deeper into the cultural differences of product engineering teams and operations teams and ask you guys, like, what are specific things that you felt had massive impact in bridging mm. these cultural divides? Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Um, my point of view, right, and maybe this is uh, controversial, but I actually think that the fundamental differences between product, tech, ops um, is really not that different. Uh, now, what do I mean by saying that? Now, we each have our different domain expertise, right? Be it designing a product or a feature, mm -hmm. be, it, be it coding, be it implement something in the field. But I think the one underlying theme that cuts across, two themes that cuts across all of this, one is really, really have to be sharp, shooting for greatness in problem solving. Right? And the second one is what collaborating with, co with compassion. Yeah, what okay. it, yeah. So when we talk about um, really, really sharp in problem solving, it means uh, sometimes what I tell the guys is that, look, uh, if you can't solve the problem, you have no business being here. Right? But that's table stakes. We're not trying to solve the problem. We need to solve the problem in the most optimal manner possible. So uh, for example, if we take, uh, take fraud or take fake GPS, take any of these controversial uh, cross-cutting big problems and there, if we are not very sharp in problem solving we tend to solve it using the domain expertise that we know right so if I'm in uh, the traditional or let's say old-school ops point of view we feel that all drivers are good people and our tech is not good enough and screwing them up right so we, we tend to solve things by being lenient to drivers that's fascinating so you tend to gravitate towards the solution that your natural bias yes. moves towards. Correct, mm -hmm. right. Um, your natural, uh, I would say prejudice, right? Your natural judgment. Or maybe about. something uh, that you're more familiar with, <coughs> right? So um, if you're on the <coughs> tech side or the product side, especially if you're, let's say, haven't spent a lot of time on the ground in Indonesia interacting with drivers, you think that all these guys are all scammers, right? right? But the reality is, is yeah. uh, neither an and both. Right. So if, let's say, all these parties were to hold a high bar in problem solving, so okay, I want, I want, my bar is to make sure that I get every single fraudulent driver who is intending to do fraud, and I make sure that I don't catch anybody else, any other innocent driver, without the intent of committing fraud, and, which is a very, very high bar, right. then I think the team will have to work together and they will find more creative, more challenging, maybe takes more time, uh, but ultimately more robust and much more aligned solutions versus a, this is what it should be versus what is what it should be. So mm -hmm. that's what I mean by really, really sharp, high bar problem solving. Yeah. So does that mean that defining that problem and the metric that will determine whether that problem is getting better or worse is the most important thing? That plus defining what success looks like. So not just the metric, right? But right. Uh, what are the metrics? What are the scope? And, um, and what would success look like, right? Though I think it also, like, to add, right, um, a, a big part of it is also empathy. I feel, right, it's kind of like mm. uh, the ops team, you meet drivers way more often than, like, the product engineering team, right? So naturally, you have more empathy for them because you meet them every day. Yeah. Or some less. Right, but, you know, like, when you're meeting them yeah. every day, you, you, yeah. you naturally, you know there's a lot of drivers who are, you know, they're not, they don't intend yeah. to do fraud, but it looks like they yeah. are, right? Um, so I think, you know, when, 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 gap the bridge is basically, you know, building the same level of empathy yeah. in teams that don't interact with drivers as much face to face, right? Yeah. So I think, you know, some of the things that well, we've done, like, you know, uh, visiting driver houses or getting people to stand by in the ops offices, those are actually 
really, really important. Yeah. I'd like to double click on that on that point because <clears throat> I think it's really interesting. Um, to, to what extent does empathy actually translate into excellence in problem solving? Mm. I'd like to deep dive there because I, we've noticed this happen again and again and again. When teams actually go to the ground and see things as they are, whether they are engineers, data scientists, or product managers, right? Even some members in ops that may not get out there as mm -hmm. often, right? Uh, you kept telling me Han's stories about when you traveled and you just, wow, you got these, uh, this is completely different to what I thought it was. Mm -hmm. same, same with me as well. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and, you know, when I take GoRide, GoRide is our service ride hailing for motorcycles. I take it about three times a day. I take GoCar maybe more like five times a week uh, because I like getting everywhere fast. And the more I interact with the drivers, and some of them that notice who I am will start complaining <laughs> about issues that, I, that, that, that they're facing. You know, it is the, the, the probability of addressing those problems mm. when you have a first-hand interaction become exponentially increased. Mm. I just keep noticing this trend. Yeah. Like, when key decision makers get closer to a problem, the probability of that problem being solved becomes higher. I've noticed that. I don't know. Do you agree with that? Do you? I, I agree with that. I mean, you know, specifically on the empathy front, right? I mean, you know, when you are using the product every day, right, and you hear from the driver every day, it just, you know, at least for me, it feels worse when someone not related to the company is complaining to you about, mm. you know, about your work and how it's affecting their lives and mm -hmm. it kind of, you know, makes me want to move faster, right? right. I, I wish everyone could have the same experience, right? right? But, you know, we live in a distributed, our, mm. we have a distributed working environment. So I guess this is a problem we still kind of need to solve together, right? Which is basically how do we make sure everyone, specifically in the product engineering team, has these kinds of interactions, right? Um, you know, I think, uh, again, going back to Singapore, um, uh, we ran a few weeks of internal testing Right, and and we got you know people to fly in and just you know take rides every day, and we actually uncovered a lot of issues that way that were already there even before mm. we did this, right? Yeah. But because you don't really experience it until you start using it yourself or until the driver starts complaining to you and you hear it with your own ears, um, a lot of issues got fixed, right? So right. Um, I mean you know it's definitely a very powerful tool. I, I think for the listeners that that don't know, it's like Gojek has a multi-location product engineering team. We've got a big, big uh, uh, kind of data science and, uh, uh, and, and, and data engineering center in Singapore. Uh, we've got a very, very big uh, Bangalore development center full of uh, uh, engineers and product managers as well. And so a lot of those people, they do travel to Indonesia, but they, they, they don't live in yeah. Indonesia where the core part of our services is. Yeah. Some of them now Singapore launched, so I, I would love to, to talk about in relation to this empathy, mm -hmm. now that Singapore launched, what do you think was the impact of being able to experience our service mm -hmm. to, to the engineers and the data scientists locally in Singapore? Yeah, um, I, I think one thing one of, the, one of my developers uh, said to me is, um, you know, uh, now it feels real, right? Like when you're just in Bangalore, <laughs> like you're looking at numbers on the dashboard, you're right, worried yeah. if like concurrent bookings goes down right. or if something goes red, but when you're actually there in the market and using it yourself, it's like, wow, I see my code in action. That, right. that is a quote I heard. Yeah. Right? And, right. you know, I think that's really powerful. Right. Um, and, and, you know, uh, another good thing about Singapore is that people speak English. So <laughs> now they get to hear feedback about yeah. the products they work on in, in a language they both speak. Right. But in, in, in Indonesia, it's tougher because right? not a lot of our drivers speak English. But, you know, in Singapore, you definitely get the direct feedback. Right. Mm -hmm. I think my sense on, yeah. on empathy also goes to both ways. Right. Um, yeah. For some of us who are out in the field, we may not fully comprehend that we may see some glitch or some issue, but we may have no appreciation of how many man hours it will take to fix this, or that if maybe it's really not so fixable on the tech side at this point in time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. It's or, like it, or it looks the, simple. Yeah, this right? is simple. <laughs> like, why can't you just yeah, add the, these yeah, two fields yeah, to the driver data? Exactly. Right? <laughs> That's not just ops. I encounter that <laughs> all day, every day, every yeah. day. So, so I think empathy goes goes both ways. Yeah. Um, and, but I think to me, um, when I think of empathy, I, to me, as how it relates to problem solving, uh, the way that I think about that is that having more empathy doesn't necessarily de facto gives you a better solution. I agree. Uh, but what it does is it makes you more intellectually curious. 
right? Yeah. Right, and it opens up your point of view to exploring various different angles too, and it opens up your willingness to redefine or rescope the problem. Right? Okay. And in so doing, that increases the chances of having um, a higher uh, actionable impact. Well, why is that? What is the connection between empathy and intellectual curiosity? What do you think is the, the mechanism that is happening there? Yeah, so I think it's, um, okay, <clears throat> The simplest way that, that I can think about it is that we, are, we don't know what we don't know, right? Mm. So, and if we are intellectually curious, we are aware that there are unknown unknowns to us, but that it is actually could be happening out there in real life. So when we're intellectually, because we're, we're, we have empathy, we, we hear enough anecdotes that something triggers off in my mind that, hey, I'm actually, I'm, I don't know everything that I think I do. So when a problem comes up, when somebody gives in a, an anecdote or gives in an input, I don't shut it down, right? Or I don't gravitate towards whatever I'm more familiar with. But I'm willing to sit down, think it through, put, do a couple of queries, at least let it, let it percolate. So it basically helps you prioritize the issue to solve. Yeah, or at least it, it, you, you, don't, you don't kick it out immediately. Right? You, sure. do, you, don't, uh, you don't deprioritize it immediately. Yeah. But is that because you just care more when you empathize? Is, is that what's, what's happening? I think there is, there is that human element, uh, but sometimes just caring more doesn't necessarily give you a better outcome, right? In fact, sometimes caring in an inappropriate manner will lead you to a less optimal outcome. Yeah. So I have many examples of that, that I've been responsible myself, yeah. right? So obviously I have a group mm. uh, where I'm in with a bunch of drivers. Um, you're, you're both in that group. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you know, in the beginning part of that, I would hear all of this chatter and I would get so emotionally invested in, in their complaints that I would start firing off instructions. So I'd, hey, fix this right now, top priority, yeah. everything. And, and basically I created this big kind of uh, vicious cycle of demotivation in the product teams who could get nothing done because I was constantly reprioritizing <laughs> what they were doing. I remember these days. And so, <laughs> and so there's, I think there's a difference here between uh, constructive empathy mm. and reactive empathy. I yes. Agree. Right? I think these things are, are two different things. And, and, and reactive empathy is in many ways emotional. Mm. Whereas constructive empathy is more reflective and yeah. thoughtful. Yes. And you kind of, and that's to your point about information. Like when we capture survey or complaints, et cetera, just feeding them through like a forum in WhatsApp is probably the worst way you can absorb information. Yeah. Yeah. Because humans are naturally yeah. not systematic with how they decide what's important. Yeah. Yeah. They see something really bad right. and they're like, no, that's the worst one, right? right. So, you know, having a structured approach to giving feedback and, and quantifying it mm. in a very rational and systematic way is the best way to go away from reactive empathy yeah. and move into constructive yeah. empathy. I think there's a word for ruinous empathy, I think. Is that, is that it? I, know, I mean, if, if you remember when we launched the Performa system, right? yeah. where, um, you know, so um, yeah, for for those of you that don't know, um, a performance system is, is an incentive program for our drivers in order to make sure that they are not canceling their orders or rejecting or rejecting orders, right? To to make sure the user experience is the best. Yeah. yeah. So, so basically, they have, they have like a, a metric, a marker, a ranking, like correct, a, a yeah. percentage. So basically, as a driver, you only get your bonus <coughs> if you complete at least X percent out of all of the bookings we send you. That's right. Right. And previously, there was no system, right? Mm -hmm. So you know. Uh, obviously, there were a lot of complaints, and you know, I mean, you could empathize with them, right? It's kind of like, um, you know, like uh, previously, I could choose the orders I wanted, the ones that went to near my house, or the ones that are shorter distance. Um, it helps me make more money faster if I can just, you know, accept whichever orders I want. It's better for me, but you know, like, so you can empathize with that, and a ruinous, like, an unhealthy way of empathizing with that would be to not. Mm. do the performa change, right? But right. on the other hand, uh, picky drivers, act, like if drivers are picky, it leads to a subpar customer experience, which means you wait longer to get a driver. And when customers wait too long, then they'll stop using the app and drivers will get less orders yeah. overall, right? Yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, yes, we empathize with the concern and uh, we totally acknowledge that now you have less flexibility, but we have to be able to explain why we're doing it and stay on track. Exactly. Right? And, and therein lies kind of the, you know, the dilemma of leading very, very big organizations, right? 
and, and, and you guys have, you know, you've risen up in the ranks to be, you know, like uh, uh, one of the most uh, powerful people in the company and you're only 27. Ooh. And so, are, uh, so, so have you, um, uh, you know, running possibly the biggest operational network out of, out of uh, most of the tech companies in this region. Mm -hmm. um, and here's what I hear. I hear that there are some theories that say that the higher you go in responsibility and authority, in any position, doesn't have to be in tech companies, in any position in life, actually the lower empathy mm. you have. Now this is super interesting, right? It's a little mm. bit counterintuitive. I heard about this theory that, that people at the higher mm. levels mm. Of, of, of kind of uh, 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 responsibility, power, authority, however you want to call it, um, they systematically have less empathy. Um, I guess for many reasons. The theory is that they have to balance so many different opinions mm -hmm. that they cannot be equally empathetic to every single stakeholder that they have to please and so on. So I wanted to know, as you evolve and as you gain scale as a personal leader, what are the trade-offs that you have had to make uh, with empathy? Mm -hmm. ah, that's a good one. So first of all, I'll be the first to admit, right? I, I get feedback that um, people tell me I forgot what it's like to be to be younger or a more junior, um, you know, problem solving problem solving person, right? Uh, so I'll, I'll be the first to, to admit to that. I think if I th if I think about this, I think two things comes to mind, right? Um, and I'm not quite sure yet how all this connects, but the, the two words that comes to my mind: uh, one is trust, and the other is mission. So, um, kind of what, what triggered off in my mind is that um, I think as we move, let's say, I wouldn't say up, but as our responsibilities increase, so to speak, uh, the mission must gain an ever bigger proportion of our mind share, mm. right? And it is up to us on what that mission is. So if that mission is to um, improve the world, and that mission is to give our drivers uh, a better life, right? The empathy becomes secondary to that because uh, becomes secondary to the mission, right? If let's say the mission is to improve drivers' lives, then of course the empathy towards drivers will be very high, but the empathy towards everybody else could be less, right? Right? Um, or vice versa, if the mission is to you know, uh, improve the world, then maybe we get so sucked into that mission that our empathy to everyone around us, you know, takes second fiddle. So trading off uh, the sense of mission and purpose uh, versus kind of empathy to the people around us or to the constituents, that's one trade-off that I've had to juggle. The second one is trust. And what I say that is because um, you know, arguably trust and empathy is like a Venn diagram, right? There's some crossover. Um, but when I have people in the team, uh, if we trust the team, right? And trust is not just a, a function of I think that you are a good person. It's also a function, it's a function of that plus that you are capable and that you are dependable, right? right? Uh, but if there's trust in the team or if there's trust across teams, then that helps to offset, uh, let's say, the declining empathy uh, as we kind of expand to bigger and bigger roles. Because the, the amount of capacity that the human brain has to constantly juggle and handle 50,000 things going at the same time uh, you know, you will get short, you, know, you have a very short attention span. And so trust in the team, trust in the group, trust in the mission, trust in the company uh, will help to offset uh, the declining empathy quite a bit. At least those are the two things I felt. Mm -hmm. I, I, at this stage, any decision, in my case, any decision I make will 100% create some level of dissatisfaction. Like, there's literally now, at my stage, no decision I can make that does not make me look unempathetic to one group or another. Yeah. And I, don't, I think you guys are already at that stage as well. And I think this is, this is one thing that I think they don't really teach you in the theories of leadership, right? <laughs> when, you're, when you're starting out, and it's, and it's a super, uh, you know, you need a lot of mental resilience mm. to, to be able to take the flack for every single trade-off that you have to make, yeah, invariably. Yeah. It's very easy to appease people at small stake yeah. decision-making. Yeah. 
at big stake decision making, even if it's the correct decision, and you hope to God it is the right decision, you will invariably create a very uh, discontented portion of, of your team that sees you as being super unempathetic, yeah. right? And I think a lot of discussions about leadership don't mention the fact that, you know, this is normal. Like, yes. you just gotta, yes. you, you just gotta own it. It doesn't mean that you're necessarily doing a bad job, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. And I think that that's, that's an important thing. It's, uh, I, ho I wish someone told me that when I was starting up because I was really bugged about it. I was really demotivated. Why is everything I'm deciding causing such a huge amount of, you know, resentment yeah. in some people, you know? Even though I feel like this is fundamentally the correct thing to do. I don't know, I don't. Yeah, I think like, you know, uh, going back to Hans's point, right, you know, um, uh, at the end of the, like you use empathy like empathy alone doesn't really help it's the pro at the end of the day it's how you solve it's how you do problem solving right so you know like empathy informs you of you know like what um how you prioritize the issues to tackle right you know based on whether you know based on empathizing with your users empathizing with the drivers empathizing with the people on the team who are overworking themselves Right, because there's some crazy ops issue going on that the product team hasn't solved yet. But you know, at the end of the day, making that trade-off to me has to be pu purely rational, right? I mean, obviously empathy yeah. plays a role there, but um, you know, since as you said, any decision you make will seem unempathetic to someone anyway. That's why, like you know, to make the trade-off, you have to be good at rational problem solving. Yeah, right. yeah. Like, like you know, if you want to keep everyone happy, sell ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's true. Don't lead. Yeah. Don't lead. <laughs> oh man, these are. I want to kind of uh, uh, use the last part of our, our section to kind of uh, ask you, like, what's the craziest story or experience that, that you've had in this in this crazy journey we've had. You know, out, out there in the world, what's 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 what's, what's the craziest thing that's actually happened to you? Guys? Nito, go ahead. <laughs> hey, I, I think one, you know, definitely in the top three was when we switched from a bidding allocation model to one-to-one -one allocation. You remember mm. that? So, um, okay, so a bit of context. Um, so just to explain to the listeners, um, uh, before we were sending drivers multiple orders and yeah. they could pick. Yeah, and then so, we had to shift to actually just giving them one at a time. Yeah, right? so like this was what, four years ago? Yeah. Three and a half to four it years ago, time. right? Yeah. Um, so uh, we had this model where um, when you make an order, we send it simultaneously to all of the drivers within a certain radius of your pickup location. And the driver who wins is the driver who accepts first, mm. right? Now, this didn't really work beyond a certain scale because one, like there was too much concurrency, right? So drivers were getting flooded with bids, but also conceptually, you're not getting the driver who's closest to you. You're getting the driver who has the fastest fingers, the best data connection, and the best phone. Yes. Mm. Right? And this mm. created more issues where uh, at the time, um, uh, some people modified our driver app and added this feature called auto bid, yep. which would automatically accept every incoming bid, which meant that if you don't have a modded app that has auto bid in it, you'll never win a bid, right? Because it automatically accepts, right? So that was something we had to deal with, right? Uh, then we decided to, s so how, it was so bad that, you know, remember Tiasum, our old office? Yeah, so, the old like, office, probably the size of this room. That sort we're of, in. yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> like I, I was- At the top part, right, yeah. Yeah, I was sitting there looking at drivers hanging outside in the yard, like waiting for an order, and I would try and book, and I would go to no driver found. Just ridiculous because I see five drivers in front of me waiting for an order. Yeah. Right. So so we changed. And I was that. yelling a lot during that period because I kept trying the same thing. Yes. And I, like we were all. I created the same hell thing. for the team. For yes. That. And yeah. we were all making it worse because we were just adding more and more load into the system, right. which made it worse. Right. So we switched that. Right. So um, now we switched to a system where um, you only send the booking to one driver at a time. Right. Meaning that. Um, uh, you will get the driver that's nearest to your pickup point, but the trade-off here is you might have longer dispatch time, right? Because right? now you have to wait longer until you find a driver who will accept. Previously, if you sent to 10 drivers, probably one will accept, right? right? Uh, so this is why we introduced the Performa system, right? And when we announced this, uh, there were demonstrations. I remember... Just to give um, some sense, how big were these demonstrations? I right? remember drivers basically, you know, blocking the roads in front of our office yeah. and there was like a pickup truck and they were playing like, you know, 
<laughs> songs, yeah. and there was a guy with a megaphone. It was, it was pretty intense. Yeah. I remember at some point we had to go to the police station to meet the drivers. Remember that? Oh yeah, I had to. I had to step in. It was mediated by uh, uh, the police department. Yes. <laughs> uh, where where I had to you know come in and have a discussion and and bridge as a mediator to the drivers. And I think my team were so scared for my safety. That they were like, no, 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 maybe you shouldn't walk in. You yeah. know, you, you had a few bodyguards. And, uh, they were protecting you so well that like there was a puddle, and like Nadim jumped onto one of the bodyguards. And the bodyguard like walked in across the puddle. And I was like, okay, I think this is a bit too much. <laughs> And it was so funny because as soon as soon as I walked in and, and my team were like telling me, no, no, you shouldn't come. And I'm like, okay, whatever, guys. It's going to be fine. I'll just go inside. And then I saw the drivers get up and come towards me and I thought I was dead. But in reality, actually what happened was they came towards me and started taking selfies, selfies. with me. <laughs> and I thought this was like the moment when I realized that, okay, okay, these, these drivers just really wanted to be heard yeah. and we needed to be there to be heard and I needed to be there Empathy, face to right? face. I mean, exactly. yeah, we made a few slides on, you know, how this is ultimately better for them because they get more orders. Exactly. Which is right? true, Which actually. Is true. We Which have is to true, to but prove it. we have yeah. to show the why. Right, and I think uh, uh, you know, riot or demonstration management has been a key skill that I think only Gojek is quite unique in this. I think a lot of tech companies and founders out there, you know, when they do something about pricing or change in policy, you know, they might get social media complaints. We have demonstrations and, yeah. and riots quite often, so I think that's that's a huge challenge for yeah. us. Because it boils down to what you mentioned before, right? That you know, any decision you make will seem unempathetic to someone. Yes. yes. Right, and oftentimes when it's related to incentives or Pricing, it looks unempathetic to our drivers, right? Even though maybe we made that decision with our customers in mind and ensuring they have the best experience, which ultimately benefits drivers as well. So that's right. Yeah. I mean, I think Nadim, I think for me, um, look, it's been a, it's been one heck of a ride. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, and again, thank you to two of you and everybody else for um, inviting me and accepting me to the organization. I, I really mean that in a very heartfelt way. Same here, man. Uh, if I were to think back about the craziness, oh my God, we'll be here all day. Um, <laughs> but I think two things I like to share, right? Um, so one is, as a general theme, I am I'm at a loss of words at uh, just how resilient and how amazing our drivers are. Look, look, that's it's crazy. It, it yeah. is crazy. It's absolutely insane, right? I mean, look, there, there are also um, you know, drivers who are oknum, right, who are, are not bad drivers, let's say. But you know, the stream of uh, information we get about uh, you know, drivers rushing towards a burning building, literally, yeah. Right? Yeah. to help fight the fire. Yeah. Uh, drivers who took their savings and when the earthquake hit um, in, in Palu, what gathering. about when, when there was a terrorism attack when in Jakarta, the bomb, attack. and we had that photo of that Gojek driver going into the site and pulling a lady out exactly. of that bomb site? Uh, I mean, truly heroic. It's, it's, yeah. it's just, and it, it happens, you know, it happens every day or every week, yeah. right? The way they take care of each other is also oh, very it, inspiring, it is, right? It is amazing. Yeah. I mean, there's, amazing. there's this thing that, that they set up to, you know, an, an organization to take care of the, the kids of, the orphan yes. kids of drivers yeah. who passed away. Yeah. I found that very, very Correct. inspiring. And, and yeah. plus, you know, all their other creativity, you know, I, I, was, I almost fell off my chair, this one driver, uh, a motorcycle driver, right? At the back of his jacket, his Go Jack jacket, he put in like a, a, a small TV screen, right? So was screening like Mission Impossible or something. Wait, on, on the back on of the, the jacket? On the back of the jacket. <laughs> Seriously? Yes. Wow, I've never I've seen, never right? seen that. Uh, yeah. And I have to, I'll forward it to you guys. Um, <laughs> and you know how drivers would give very small pieces of notes saying thank you for taking my, go. I mean, that whole theme about, um, you know, just how generous, how amazing, hardworking and resilient our drivers. And that, that's one thing that continues to uh, I just feel very humble, right? And I tell yeah. my wife and I tell my son um, about this every week. I think the other thing, you know, if you don't mind me to be a bit selfish, is I am just so proud of the way that uh, the whole ops team and the Re Indonesia region team and the ops tech team has just pulled together uh, throughout the year. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's 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 been a journey, right? Yeah. And there were there were some some highs and there were some lows. Yeah. Uh, a lot, lot of lows. A lot of lows. <laughs> yes, a lot of lows. And and I have, wow. You know, I think and I think, uh, ten months later, eleven months later, you no, know, we have we really have something special, mm. right? Um, and you can just feel it, right? The, the team is coming together. The team is bonding. The team is stepping up like crazy. 
and um, and I, I really feel good about that. So I think those are the two kind of crazy themes for me right. Right, so far. I I think that you know I think a lot of people don't realize uh, out there that. You know, Gojek is the name of a company, a technology company that provides all these ride hailing, two-wheeler, four-wheeler, food delivery, payments, and so on. We're a super app, right? But there is also this thing called the Gojek community mm. of drivers that has really a completely separate life outside yeah. of our company. Yes. They have yeah. their own institutions, they yeah. have their own events, yeah. they have even their own like kind of parties, yeah. right? Yeah. It's amazing. They have yeah. their own uh, uh, ecosystem. And the thing that connects all of them together is the fact that they're all Gojek drivers, yeah. right? And there is this kind of, uh, uh, there are cottage industries that yeah. serve them, right? Like yeah. there's a whole other internal economy yeah. there that is completely independent from Gojek the company, right? Uh, and, and I think that a lot of people don't realize that. Mm. And I think it's beautiful when you, when you create uh, a, a platform that truly creates other ecosystems that independently grow yeah. outside of actually whatever you do on yeah. your side, right? And I think that's what kind of makes our jobs every day, even though hard, really special. Okay. Guys, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Hope to have you back again soon. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks a lot. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you liked it, please hit like, subscribe, and follow us on social media. Thanks so much for tuning in.